Hi, I'm Dominic Power. I'm a consultant hand and peripheral nerve surgeon based in the UK. I'm going to talk to you today about hand-brain interactions and how we can use our knowledge of hand-brain interactions to optimise functional recovery after injury to the hand. Now, the adult human brain has about 100 billion neurons, each with numerous synaptic connections. And this differs from the child brain. The child brain has more open synaptic connections available, but the process of learning, laying down information, laying down memory, laying down motor pathways is all about closing synaptic connections. But this offers us the great ability to reopen dormant or redundant synaptic connections in the injured adult brain, the so-called possibility for neural plasticity in recovering from injury. Now the human brain is a supercomputer. It receives sensory information from a number of domains and then it affects motor commands. The sensory source of input can be either taste, sight, hearing, smell, touch, what we term the senses. And I'm going to talk predominantly about the sensation of touch. Now, the man you can see at the bottom right of the slide is the sensory homunculus, which is the cortical representation of cutaneous innervation density. So it gives us some sense of the importance of the hand in terms of processing sensory information. The nervous system is simply a wiring system connecting the brain and the periphery. And there are particular tracks within the central nervous system, within the spinal cord and within the peripheral nerves that carry this, this information. What you must remember is that the peripheral nerves carry a whole host of different modalities of sensation. So they carry autonomic function, pain, light touch, vibration sense, as well as mechanical information from the spindle, from the Golgi tendon apparatus, as well as affecting motor commands through the efferents. And the brain is the central control center. So the para pyramidal system, which is the oldest part of the brain, sends signals down to the spinal cord and then out to the periphery to the muscles. And this is modified through the cerebellum, which also receives sensory input from the visual pathways, the visual cortex, and from the ear for balance, and the extra pyramidal system with memory. But it is possible for the hand to interact with the spinal cord without involvement of the brain. Certainly not in the first instance. And this is the basis of the spinal reflex pathways. On the left hand side showing a direct communication between sensory and motor neurone for the spinal reflex pathway. And on the right hand side with the use of an interneuron in affecting a withdrawal response from a noxious uh, cutaneous stimulus. So the brain interacts with the spinal cord and the hand and the hand interacts with the brain through the spinal cord. But the hand can also interact with the spinal cord without involvement of the brain directly. So what are the functions of the hand? Well, in the same way that all of our senses are really extensions of the brain, so for instance the retina is an extension of the brain providing sensory visual information, the hand is providing sensory cutaneous information to the brain. But the hand also allows us to interpret our environment. Okay, have a look okay. at a short video. Let's have a little look. Let's have a little look. Okay, this is tactile okay. Put them on the bag. Put them on the bag. Shake them. Shake them. Okay, put your hand okay, inside, put your hand inside and, start and start feeling through, feeling until, you through until you find the one that's really hard. Tactile gnosis is the ability to manipulate an object, to feel and touch, and to compare it to memory. This then gives us the ability to interpret our environment. So in this case, my daughter is demonstrating the ability to pull a blank Scrabble tile from a bag containing other Scrabble tiles with printed information. So tactile gnosis, a unique ability from our hand. Put it down on the table. Put it down on the table. Brilliant. Brilliant. Big smile. Big smile. So by processing sensory information, we can interpret our environment and we can interact with our environment. Now the forelimb of lower mammals is really just used for grasping for feeding and so on. When we start to look at the primates, the thumb increases in length. And on the left hand side, this primate thumb is really just 
uh, for grasping and for transfer through trees. As we move into the chimpanzee, the thumb is longer, starts to oppose. You can see on the left hand side a key pinch demonstration and on the right the ability to use the hand to grasp tools. There's also finger independence and this finger independence is unique to human uh, and higher order mammals. Looking at the hand of a gorilla, the hand of a gorilla, although it has a shorter thumb than in the human adult hand, it has an uncanny likeness to the human hand, such that the fine grasp, in this case a precision grip with the thumb, can be accomplished with great dexterity. So the human hand has a longer thumb, it can fully oppose, there's finger independence, there's palmar arching. Now I'm going to talk about the brain-hand pathway dominance. So we've seen how our brain and our hand interact through the spinal cord. But what I want to talk to you is about the dominance of the neural pathways and sensory input from the hand. Yes, we can override this with some visual information and some auditory information and so on. Uh, but the hand-brain interaction is truly dominant in humans. So what I want you to do is look at this figure six and with your toe of your right leg I would like you to start at the top and trace out the figure six. Once you've done that a few times continue to do it and then with your hand I would like you to draw a circle and start in front of your face drawing the circle clockwise. As you do that you notice that your movement within the hand overrides the movement in the foot and your foot starts to reverse. Now the reason for this is not fully understood but it's thought to be because of the importance and the dominance of sensory input from the hand to our learning and our interaction with our environment. Now it's possible to have injury anywhere along these neural pathways. So brain injury can occur for instance with a stroke or central nervous system pathway, the pyramidal tract damage that can occur with a stroke, injuries in the spinal cord again from trauma or tumour, injury to the peripheral nerves and of course injury to the hand. Brain plasticity is what I alluded to right at the beginning which is the numerous open synaptic reflex pathways that are present within the child's brain that are then mapped to the adult patterns of synaptic connections with closing down of redundant pathways. But there's the supposedly plastic ability to rewire following loss or injury, so redundant pathways can be activated. But we can also harness these redundant pathways for learning, so we can improve performance, uh, we can recover from injury. And this is the process of how we would uh, improve performance or performance enhancement. So we use a number of modalities in order to do this. Auditory feedback. So just think of a sporting coach telling someone how they're doing. Visual feedback. The process of pre-visualization or thinking about movements that one is going to undertake. Motor repetition and all these come together to give performance enhancement. Now we can use this in lots of different ways. We use this in hand therapy. You'll see the hand therapist working with a patient who's been injured and she'll be telling him to undertake his movements, showing him what to do, asking him to repeat it and giving him positive reinforcement. A smile on her face telling him that he's doing very well. And this is how we improve performance with sports coaching. Think about how we teach children to read using phonics. We use auditory information, ah, 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 b, 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 as well as physical demonstration of the letter action at the same time as learning how the letter is written and how the letter looks. We can use vision to overcome language barriers. So you might think this is a man struggling with an umbrella, but in actual fact it's a universal sign for roadworks. We can actually use visual compensation for hearing loss, and this is the process of sign language. We can use tactile compensation for visual loss. This is Braille. Now I'm going to come on to talk about something called the mirror neuron. 
the mirror neuron is thought to be a type of central nervous system neural cell connection that helps in relearning recognition of self and empathy which is what makes us uniquely human so for instance a child will copy what their parents are doing mirror therapy has been used as a way of dealing with neuropathic pain so in an upper limb amputation with severe phantom limb pain visually looking at a reflection of the good hand as it moves seen in the mirror can override pain signals coming from the amputation stump and can tell the brain that actually the hand isn't so badly injured and the pain isn't so severe. So we can use mirror therapy for treating neuropathic pain. Now it must be remembered that when someone is born without an upper limb or with an injury or deformity of the upper limb then their functional gains and are usually much greater than those who have suffered a traumatic loss. Have a look at this short video. What are the socio-economic functions of the hand? Well, the hand is what makes us independent as humans. It allows us to perform our activities of daily living, communicate, generate an income, defend ourselves. It allows us to undertake recreational pursuits, and it's also involved in procreation. So we use it for feeding, communication, both in the historic sense and also in the new modern electronic sense allows us to undertake our job, whatever that may be, physical defence, recreational pursuits, and of course an involvement in human interaction, loving relationships and procreation. So now I'm going to talk to you about the injured hand. We understand the importance of the hand as a source of sensory information, a way of interacting with our environment and a way that, that makes us uniquely human and gives us our independence. So when the hand is injured, how do we define what is a significant hand injury? Significant hand injuries may be different from one person to another, and that depends on your unique functional requirements. So for instance, for the professional violinist, a loss of sensation and the loss of the pulp of the hypernicheal tissue in the finger in the string hand is effectively tactile blindness. And this is a career ending injury. We need a number of things to contribute to optimal hand function. The hand needs to be able to move. It needs to be sensate, flexible, we need to have control over movement. It needs to be stable within its joints. And all of this comes together to give us our hand function. So what happens after an injury? Well, there's obviously pain, swelling, stiffness, deformity, maybe sensitivity or numbness following nerve injury, cold intolerance, and there may be joint instability.
and the consequences of this are functional impairment with loss of independence, psychological worries, cosmetic worries, there might be issues about disturbance of body image, there may be psychological sequelae with anxiety and depression, flashbacks to an injury, and of course a loss of independence, financial implications and worries about the future and future employment prospects. So how do we assess hand function? We've got a heterogeneous group of people within our population and each has individual different functional demands. So when we assess hand function, whose perspective do we assess it from? Now there are different ways we can look at this. As a hand surgeon, I want to try and identify important functional losses and then plan reconstruction accordingly. And I want to be able to compare my outcomes to those of published standards. But a lawyer wants to be able to quantify loss for the purpose of a financial settlement. A hand therapist will want to monitor recovery, look at progression and tailor treatment to an individual's requirements. How do we assess hand function? Well, a crude measure is to use what we would term the hand grips. There are four thumb base grips and four hand grips. So those grips are precision, tip to tip, pulp to pulp, tripod, power, hook, span grasp and flat hand. And I'll demonstrate. So a precision grip, which is tip to tip between the tip of the thumb and the tip of the index finger, requires good median nerve sensation, needs median hand intrinsics and anterior interosseous nerve function. A pulp to pulp grip requires median sensation and hand intrinsic function. A key pinch, again using the thumb, needs anterior interosseous nerve and first dorsal interosseous nerve and adductor pollicis. And this is the ability to flex the thumb down against a stable index finger PIP joint. A tripod or chuck grip requires FDS function, FPL, median sensation, and this allows us to manipulate small objects. And then we get onto the hand grips. Now, the thumb does contribute about 10% to power grip within the hand, but this is really a function of FDP and ulnar nerve function. Hook grip, which is the ability of the fingers to hook around or lift an object. This can be undertaken without a thumb, requires FDS and FDP. Span grasp, which is the ability of the hand to stretch and accommodate around an object, requires ulnar nerve function, requires a palmar arch, requires a wide web space, function of both APL, the extensors and the hand intrinsics. And a flat hand, which is the ability of your hand to go flat on a surface, such as pushing open a door. This requires a mobile wrist and fingers into extension, and this can be independent of thumb function. So when we look at a hand and we look at hand function, we've got power activities and grasp, and we've got dexterous activities. Now these dexterous activities predominantly involve the use of the thumb. So when we see an injured hand, we can start to decide which grips are involved and what the effect might be on a patient but we need to understand the individual patient's needs so we can understand the impact of that particular loss on that patient. So looking here, a short thumb following amputation is going to affect key pinch, pulp to pulp, precision tripod grips, but will have a less effect on power grip, hook grip, and on flat hand. A Jupitron's pretendinous cord causing a flexion contracture of the MCP joint is going to affect flat hand grip. An absence of the thumb is going to affect all of the thumb base grips and to a lesser degree it will affect power grip and it will affect span grasp. It won't impair the ability to undertake a hook grip or a flat hand grip. And the loss of all digits apart from the thumb is significantly going to impair hand function. So how do we measure hand function? Well, we can undertake crude measures to compare between patients for the purposes of audit and research. And we can use a JMAR dynamometer, which is a uh, hydraulic strain gauge. We can also use a key pinch uh, gauge, which can be used to assess strength of key pinch, also pulp to pulp and precision grips within the thumb. When it comes to measuring sensation, this is more difficult. I tend to use monofilaments and on the left you can see a Sims-Weinstein monofilament and when these fibres bend 
they give a quantified pressure threshold onto the skin and using a series of monofilaments one can work out where the threshold is for first detection. It is possible to use a pinwheel and to demonstrate two-point discrimination either static or dynamic but this isn't a very reliable method of measuring sensation partly because two-point discrimination can be improved significantly with training. Goniometry is used to measure joint function and joint position and this is particularly important in assessing progress and recovery after injury. And for the purposes of research and studies we can actually look at validated assessment tools. So on the top left is a MOBA pickup test looking at fine ability within the hand and fingers to pick up small objects and transfer them to a pot. And there's the Bennett hand tool test, Minnesota dexterity test and the Purdue pegboard test. What are our aims of reconstruction? Well we've got two conflicting interests, we've got form and function. Patients are often more concerned about form, we are often more concerned as clinicians about trying to restore function. Sometimes we can do both, so for this very severe injury with degloving and loss of the distal third of the thumb pulp, exposing the bone and losing the nail bed and germinal matrix, a vascularized free toe pulp transfer can achieve excellent cosmetic and functional benefits, particularly with the sensory re of the thumb pulp by anastomosing the nerves to the parent nerves within the thumb. Sometimes we're able to deal with a complex injury like this. Lift your wrist up as much as you can. With excellent, and bend your wrist as much as you can. Turn your hand so it faces me. That's it. Open your hand. Close your fingers. Close your fingers. Make a tight fist. Make a tight fist. Open your hand. Open your hand. Okay. Okay. Turn it back. Turn it back. Okay. Okay. So a complex injury like this with loss of dorsal wrist capsule, wrist extensors, finger extensors and soft tissue can be dealt with with stage reconstruction, recreating the soft tissue envelope and the tendons that are necessary, so form and function. This is a severe injury to a thumb and to uh, the fingers from a lawnmower and there's open injury to all of the joints within the thumb, significant loss of all of the dorsal tissues and the extensor tendons. And this has been treated with a reconstruction with a local pedicled flap and tendon reconstruction to try and achieve function. Uh, but the trade-off may be that the form may be impaired and some patients do find the cosmetic appearance of the donor site unacceptable. This is a radial forearm reverse flow pedicle flap. You can blanch it. You can blanch it. You just stroke it as well. Bring it into the Brilliant. Brilliant. And then can you lift it up and, and, you lift it it up and show how it insects? Didn't just show you the, Didn't the vessel. Just show the, the vessel. So this case is a complex composite tissue loss on the back of the hand can be reconstructed with a pedicled posterior interosseous flap. And here function is always a priority and the difficulty is obviously patients perceptions is that they want to achieve form and function wherever possible. But sometimes with severe injuries function may be the only option available to us. In very severe disabling injuries such as these with extensive injury to the hand, prosthetics can be used ultimately to try and improve the form. But in terms of achieving function we have to consider the future and perhaps intelligent prosthetics may confer some advantage particularly if we can not only gain intelligent control, so control through the brain and through thinking about motor function, but also sensory feedback.
that will allow us to achieve really great things with a prosthetic somewhere close to the dexterous manipulation or the tactile gnosis that's, a, that's possible in the normal uninjured human hand. The future of prosthetics does offer very exciting possibilities and there is now brain activated intelligent prosthetic design which is improving the dexterous ability for us. So in these very severely injured hands what will be offered in the future? Surgical reconstruction with an attempt at function and as close to near normal form as is achievable. Prosthetics in the cases where function is not achievable or maybe the future lies in hand transplantation with the ability of the donor hand to incorporate with the host so that sensory input can be sent to the brain and effector commands can be sent back to the hand to interact with the environment. So maybe this is the future. Thank you for listening.